But I want to start us off um, with a question. What, what's your best day? Your best day, flat out. Um, if you were to describe what your best day is in your life so far, um, maybe it's, maybe it's a, a graduation, whether it be high school, college, maybe it's a master's, uh, maybe even doctorate um, if you're up there. Maybe you got a job, got a promotion that you wanted. Um, you won an award, maybe it was for sports or in school or maybe even afterwards at work or some, some other uh, achievement. Maybe it's celebrating the Chiefs winning a Super Bowl again. Uh, maybe that's your best day. I wondered if that would do it. Um, a, maybe it was a, a restored relationship in your life, uh, a, a reconciliation of a marriage, something like that. I don't know what it is for you, um, but what is it when you look back, you say, that, you know, that, was, that was the best day, the best day ever. For me, um, I'd love to hear from every one of you, but we don't have all day, so I'll just share one quick anecdote from my life of what my favorite day was, and it happens to be my wedding day. And I'm not doing this to get brownie points, it really was the, the best day. Um, we, if you've been around here a while, you know that we used to do kind of filming trips overseas. We've been to Israel, Turkey, Greece, uh, uh, Rome, all, all over the place. And we had a filming trip set up for Rome in 2019. We were going to go over there and film. Me and my wife got uh, engaged a couple months before that. And we said, well, why not? So we rented a rooftop and got married in Rome. And it's not because we're rich, okay? <laughs> I'm a poor youth pastor. My salary is public. If you have any questions... Um, <laughs> But it was, we were already on our way over there. It was honestly a lot cheaper than doing a, a wedding. Um, and so here, here's a, a glimpse. We got to walk around Rome and get pictures and everything. It was a, it was a beautiful day. This is actually, um, if you know what the Pantheon is, uh, this is, this is the Pantheon. There's a big courtyard there and a couple hundred people are there. And this is moments before they all started like clapping and cheering for us. And we're like, well, we're celebrities now. This is great. Um, <laughs> But it was really special, and I have to show you one of my favorite photos from our wedding. We sat down, we were doing our, our photos, and these two guys from Australia uh, decided to cheers us uh, while, we were, while we were taking our photos. I thought this was absolutely hilarious. Um, this is, this is uh, my, my best day. We, we, got, we got married, we had an incredible meal um, afterwards at this, this restaurant, and then um, it, it got even better, because at 2 a.m., we got on different flights to fly back to the States. So, um, great way to, to end your wedding day. Um, so what, what's your best day, though? What's your best day? Um, it probably has a lot to do with your stage of life, depending on where, where you're at. Um, but thinking about it, as I sat down this week and started thinking about it, I, I had a hard time coming up with that, to be honest with you. Because I don't know if you're like me, but I, it's a lot easier for me to think of, think of and pinpoint my worst days than my best days. Would you agree? I can come up with plenty of, of my worst days, and so it's difficult... For me, and if it's difficult for us to pick out a best day personally, um, how, how are we going to pick out a, like a best day historically, right? Um, uh, holidays help us with that, whether it be July 4th or Emancipation Day or Christmas or even Easter. They help us mark special days throughout history. But what, how do we figure out what the best day in history was? And if you're here on Easter, you're probably assuming you figured it out. I'm going to say it's Easter, and you're wrong. It's actually not. I'm just kidding. It is. It is, I, I, no surprise, we're going to talk, I, I believe that's the, the best day. But what happens on that day leads us to believe that it is um, the greatest day in human history. Um, it, that's why today, really, if you're a follower of Jesus, it's our Super Bowl. I know the Chiefs have done their thing, but this is the real Super Bowl for us that are followers of Jesus. And it's the day that we got hope. And you can't live without any sort of hope, even if it's that like tomorrow is going to be just a little bit better than today. We can't live without any sort of hope. Hope is what keeps us going. And anyone who's been in the throes of depression or in dark days, you know that you, without it, it makes us not want to live because what is living without any sort of hope? It feels like our, our best days, and I don't know about you, sometimes it can feel like our best days are getting further and further apart, so how do we find hope in the middle? And if you came here today looking for hope, I believe you came to the right place. And I hope to help, help you leave with that today. Our heart as a church is to um, be a place that no matter who you are or where you've been, we believe there's hope for a new story in Jesus. It's printed on the back of our building. You probably saw that maybe if you parked back there. We believe this to our core. Hope has a name, and his name is Jesus, as we were just singing about. And what I want to do today is talk about just that, 
And I'll give you a roadmap really quick. Here's where we're going to go so there's no surprises or twists and turns, okay? I'm gonna, we're going to walk through a quick eyewitness account of what happened that day. I'm going to give you uh, some of the reasons why I believe the, the resurrection is compelling and, and is, is worthy of trust that you can then go and look on your own. Um, and then some implications of that, okay? I promise to try and get it done quickly. Um, and not keep us here all day, because uh, this type of stuff, I could, I could talk for a while, but I'll try not to. Does that sound good? Oh, no. <laughs> maybe, maybe I need to try it. Let me go back to the drawing board. We'll try again. Um, this is not a good uh, roadmap for where we're going today. Well, whether you like it or not, you're stuck. We're here. So turn with me uh, to, to John 20. Uh, in, in your Bibles, you can scroll there. You can open your Bible. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, grab one of those hardback black ones in the seat in front of you. Turn to page 880 in those. And if you don't have a Bible at home, please take that as our gift to you. We'd love for you to take a Bible home and have that with you. Um, we're looking at a guy named uh, John, or his account, for example. Um, John is likely a name that you know or have heard of uh, from, from the Bible. He's one of the 12 closest followers of Jesus, lived life with him. He's an eyewitness walking beside Jesus for three years before um, what we know as his death, burial, and resurrection. He's walking with him, and he writes what are kind of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first four books in the New Testament are called the Gospels. They're four different guys' accounts of walking with Jesus and what that looked like. And so John is, is one of those, and he opens his account with a pretty big statement. I'll, uh, in John 20, I'll meet you there in just a second. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to catch us up. But John starts his account with um, something really big about Jesus in John 1.14. He says this. He says, The word became flesh and made, basically put on human skin and made his dwelling among us, came and lived with us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. He's saying that this, this we saw Jesus. We held his hands. We heard his voice. We smelled his B.O. because it was the first century. Let's just be honest. We saw God in flesh walk among us and that he was full of grace and truth. Now, there are people in this world that are full of grace and no truth, and there's people in this world that are full of truth and no grace. You probably can pinpoint some of them in your life. No Holy Spirit elbows here. You don't need to point them out now, but you know some of these people in your life. But he says that in Jesus, as we walked with him, what we saw was justice and and love coexisting, truth and grace and harmony. John saying, we, are, we, are, we watched him. We, these, these guys, Jesus called them in closely. He said, follow me, and they became close friends. Um, and uh, I mean, of all the miracles Jesus did, no one talks about the miracle of having 12 close friends in your 30s. Like, that's a big deal. But these, these guys were, were that. And he says, we watched his life, and we saw what love looks like. And so he says, Jesus came, he showed us how to live, he showed us how to love. There were signs, there were wonders, there were miracles, of course, that pointed to the fact that he was God, verified that. And one of the greatest miracles that we saw was the fact just how he loved people. Even people that thought they were a million miles away from him. People that, that think, when I walk into that church building, I know I'm going to burst into flames. Those type of people, maybe that was you. I'm glad nobody spontaneously burst into flames here. Maybe that's why you're watching online today, because you were nervous, but your, your computer's not going to blow up either. We're glad that you're here. That's not going to happen. But even people like that, they think they're so far away from God. Jesus loved them like they were his own family. People that were least like Jesus actually liked Jesus. They love to be around him, and Jesus welcomed those, um, welcomed them in, and the religious leaders were not too big of fans of that. And in fact, in one time Jesus was with a bunch of people at a celebration, uh, and he was with these people like tax collectors. These are people that worked for the Roman government and ripped off, ripped off their own people and took advantage of them. He not liked, not liked people. You wouldn't like them. They didn't like them. He was with them and these other people. And uh, the, the religious leaders confronted the disciples and said, hey, well, why is he doing that? We're not supposed to be with those people. We don't like those people. Why is he doing that? And Jesus overheard them, and so he responds, it's not, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. In other words, I didn't come to, to, to help people who think they don't need my help. I didn't come for those people. What he's saying to religious leaders and they didn't like it, is that you're sinners too, you just don't know it. You don't realize that you need my help. And that's, that's his point, is that we're all in that state. We're all sinners. We all need help. We all need grace. No one is perfect except for Jesus, and he loves people perfectly. 
And thank God that Jesus loves sinners. That's good news for us because that's the only kind of people that there are. And they didn't like this, so they conspired and they colluded with the Romans to put him to death on a cross. And so what started last Sunday with Palm Sunday, this year we celebrate um, or remember the events that led to that event of them hanging him on a cross. What seemed hopeful as he entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and people are shouting Hosanna, it's like, you're the Messiah, you're the one that's going to save us and and rescue us, you're going to come overthrow Rome and it's going to be awesome, that quickly turned sour. Even some of those closest to him turned on him. Judas, who, who uh, sold, he just came and he sold out Jesus for, for some quick cash. And while Jesus is with some of his, some of his disciples in this um, Garden of Gethsemane that we know, that you maybe you've heard of, which, fun, fun fact, just a little anecdote there, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, you're never going to find that in the Bible. You'll see it as a title, but you'll never find Garden of Gethsemane in the Bible. It, that, there's diff- different accounts that speak of this garden that is has a Gethsemane there, which is an olive press on the Mount of Olives. We've just called it the Garden of Gethsemane. That's a little fun note. Take that home with you. But uh, he's, he's here in this place, this garden with the Gethsemane. He's there. And if you've, I, I've been able to, to stand in, in that place and you can see the temple just across the valley. You can see the temple and you can see the eastern gate. And so Jesus would have been able to see the temple guard walk out of the eastern gate with their torches coming toward coming toward him, knowing that it is about w- w- what was coming. And so as we read the gospel accounts of his time there, the anguish is, that he's going through, he has blood coming out of his pores. Like, this is crazy. I can't imagine knowing that it's coming, knowing that you have to face this for all of us. And he just stood there. And so Judas shows up in that moment and, and, and betrays Jesus with a kiss. The disciples scatter. They take Jesus in on a bunch of trumped-up charges. And as he stood in those different court proceedings, stood there silent. And if you know how court proceedings work, if you're asked accusations and you don't rebuttal and you stand there silently, you're admitting guilt. But he was not accepting his guilt. He was accepting ours as he stood silently. That's why we read in 2 Corinthians um, that, that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. So they ridicule him. They accuse him. They beat him within an inch of his life. They spit on him. They make him carry his own cross on his tattered body. And even if you don't believe that Jesus is the son of God, let's set that aside, the injustice of the murder of the historical figure of Jesus should bother you. See, Rome didn't invent crucifixion, but they perfected it to maximize pain and to maximize shame. The very government that they were longing for the Messiah to come and overthrow the Romans, the people then utilized that brutality, the brutality of the people that they wanted to see overthrown to now punish Jesus. And there they, they at, at this place called um, Golgotha, the place of the skull, they drove nails in his wrists and in his feet and lifted him up to die. And this is what we call Good Friday. This is chapter 19 of John. We're just about caught up. And while hell was celebrating, the disciples were shaking in their boots and the, the one that they hung all their hopes on was now hanging on a cross. The one that they trusted and believed in is now laying in a tomb And then Saturday comes. Now, we know the story, right? We know what happens. We've already talked about it today. And if you you don't know that Jesus comes back from the dead, spoiler alert, it's been out for 2,000 years. I'm sorry if you missed it. But we know what happens. But try, try to put yourself in their shoes for just a moment. Saturday, they woke up and they hoped it was a dream. But it wasn't. They locked their doors. They hid terrified because Rome had more crosses and they weren't afraid to use them. And if you've ever experienced a loss like Friday, I think you can begin to recognize the numbness of Saturday. It's the day after the diagnosis. It's the day after you lose them. It's the day after they give you the divorce papers. The day after you get caught the day after the breakup, the day after the market crashes, the day after the the storm comes through and tears up everything that you have. 
It may be light outside, but it feels dark inside. And I wonder what they would have done on that Saturday. Now, I know what they couldn't do, because from Friday at sundown to Saturday at sundown, what is, what, what is that called in Jewish tradition? There are a lot of S's. Sabbath. It's the Sabbath. They couldn't work. They couldn't go places. They had to sit and rest. Now, if you're like me, I like to work to keep my mind off things. I'll go out and do yard work. I'll do, do whatever just to keep my mind off things sometimes. That's just a, a coping mechanism that, that I have. And if I was them, man, I would have been building walls. I would be doing all kinds of stuff just to keep my mind off of this. But they couldn't. They had to sit there and wait in the silence of Saturday and the numbness of Saturday. And if you've ever had a Saturday, you, you begin to wonder if Sunday is going to come. See, for them, nobody was expecting what was coming next. Nobody expected the resurrection. They weren't standing outside the tomb with like Krispy Kreme donuts and, and confetti poppers, right? Like the, t- the stone's going to roll any minute now. Like they, they had no idea. They just didn't, it just wasn't clear in their mind that this was going to happen. So how did they approach the tomb? Well, let's look at chapter 20, uh, verse 1. I'm going to put it up here, but I'll always encourage you, please look at it in your Bible. Make sure, I, I always want to verify, I'm not making stuff up, okay? The church has got herself in enough trouble with that. So whatever I put up here, just make sure that, that it's in there, okay? John 20, verse 1, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. So the stone had been removed from the entrance. This is, um, Mary is, is essentially, some of the other gospels fill in the gaps there, but she's taking spices and things because they're expecting a smelly body. Verse 2. Yeah, sorry, she saw it was empty. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the other disciple being the one Jesus loved, and said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they've put him. Now, several times through, through the book of John, he, uh, John is referring to himself as the disciple who Jesus loved. Can you imagine if that's how you introduce yourself? It's like, hey, uh, Rick, was it? Hey, uh, disciple who Jesus loved. Or you sign your mortgage papers, disciple who Jesus loved. Like, can you imagine? It's just kind of a funny thing. Like, John's got a bit of swagger. Um, but let me, tell you, let me tell you what he's not saying. Let me tell you what he's not saying. He is not saying that Jesus loved him more than the other disciples. God doesn't have favorite sons or daughters. He doesn't play favorite games. God loves you as much as he loves John. It's just that John believed it. You are the one that Jesus loved. And that's really good news. And can you imagine what that would do to your insecurity if that's what you believed, if we actually internalized that me, a sinner, in the best days and in the worst days, I'm loved by my Father. And all of my brokenness and my pain and my past, Jesus looks at us, looks at you, and says, you are the one that I love. And so John identifies himself that way, and then we get to verse 3. I want you to look at it with me. Verse 3. So Peter, and, uh, sorry, I'll read here. so Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. And this is funny. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Like, John, why'd you include that detail? <laughs> he could have left it out, but he wanted to make sure you know he's faster than Peter. <laughs> oh, man. He must have got them new kicks. You know how new shoes make you run faster? That's what happened. John 20, verse 5. Um, It says, he bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, um, as as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. And verse 8, finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, in case you forgot, (laughs) also went inside. And it says he saw and he believed. He saw the empty tomb and he believed. Look, when Mary first showed up and came to the, to the disciples and where they were at and, and she said, hey, the tomb's empty. We don't know what's going on. They thought she was outside of her mind. And so if you have, I want you to know, if you were in here and you have a hard time believing the resurrection, you were in good company because the people that walked with Jesus for three plus years still didn't get it. They missed it too. They had a hard time believing it. John even outs himself in the next verse. He says, they did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. He's like, just want you to remember that, that we still had no idea that this was going to happen. 
And if you keep reading the eyewitness accounts, you'll see Jesus popping up in various places. I encourage you, whether it's today, tomorrow, this week, please keep reading in John. Maybe read one of the other gospel accounts of, of the resurrection and, and see how all these details come together. But you see Jesus popping up in very, various places. He comes back and he, he talks to Mary and she thinks he's a gardener. And once he says her name, he's like, I know that voice. She says, Rabbi, Jesus, like you're, you, you're my, she knew who he was. He pops up to the rest of the disciples and just kind of sneaky Jesus popping around, busting through walls like the Kool-Aid man. He, he, he visits like a couple strangers on a road that we know as Emmaus. He visits them. Um, he, and over the next 40 days, he appears to over 500 people. And I'm confident that if you went to each one of them and you asked them, what is the best day in history? They would say when they saw Jesus alive. Because he was dead and now he's alive. Paul, a first century leader and influence in the church, he even said this in his letter, letter to Corinth. He was making a very strong point here. In 1 Corinthians he says, And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. So what we're doing here is completely pointless had this not happened. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Why are we here? I have better hobbies I could be doing. Why would I sit here and do this if I didn't believe the resurrection actually happened? Listen, the resurrection is not some just add-on to the faith that when, you know, I'll start following Jesus and maybe one day I'll, I'll you know, add on this resurrection thing. It is the basis of our faith. The only reason we have this, the only reason we have this in our hands is because of the resurrection. The only reason Jesus' story was worth telling is because of the resurrection. Because if he had stayed in the tomb, what is the point? And like John saw and believed, I believe there are reasons to believe. I believe there are strong reasons to believe. And I want you, want you to know this. As I just want to walk through a couple things here. Um, God never asks us to turn off our brains. Never once. To believe in the resurrection and to, follow, and to be a follower of Jesus does not mean we just live in ignorance. I'm not just bored and want to find something, something fun to do, so I just am a pastor of a church. We say here all the time, I don't know what your faith tradition is or was or where you grew up. I don't know. But your questions, your questions are welcome here. Please know that. Your questions are welcome here. They don't scare us. They don't scare God. Your, your doubts are not weakness in the church, and the church is only hurting herself to assume otherwise. So it's okay to ask for evidence. If you're open to it. Because I think we've gotten too comfortable with bad faith arguments. Where I'm sure you've seen the debates, okay, prove it to me. Prove to me that this, this thing happened. Does that sound like someone that's open to any sort of actual reasoning? And so it's okay to ask questions. If we're open to what the answer is. God never asks us to turn off our brains. He asks us to open our hearts. And so I just want to share three quick reasons why I find the story of the resurrection compelling. And the first, first of which, is that Jesus himself predicted his own resurrection. Predicted his own resurrection five times, actually. And I, I, don't, I don't know who you're following in life or what your life is built around, but I'm, for me, I'm going to go with the one that uh, predicted his resurrection and then followed through with it. I figure if he is right on that, if he is right on the impossible thing, he's going to be right on everything else, too. And in fact, this, a risen Savior, is what separates Christianity from every other major world religion. Because you're not going to find his bones. Jesus predicted his own resurrection. I find that pretty stinking compelling. Second is, is, is that uh, we just the, the recorded counts of the resurrection. Now, I, you guys ready to get nerdy? I like getting nerdy from time to time. Push up the glasses. We're going in deep, okay? Okay. Um, we trans what we translate the Bible from are called manuscripts. In fact, most, uh, pretty much all of our recorded history that we, um, that, that we have is from uh, manuscripts, written on manuscripts, unless it was carved into a rock or something, right? It comes from manuscripts. And often, as you get into the, the art and the work of what's called textual criticism, trying to, to find the original, as close to the original as we can get. Still with me? Haven't lost you yet? Okay. And as you get into the art and work of textual criticism, the position many people have, and maybe you have, 
And so we can't really trust what we have in the New Testament, for example, because the copies that we have come from later than the, when the events happened. And listen to a modern audience and maybe your follower of Jesus, that may make you nervous because it's absolutely true. It's hard to believe something is true when we know factually that the copies we have of the gospel of counts are a hundred or so years after the events happened. And that may freak some of you out because you don't realize that this means the New Testament is the best and most reliable book in all of antiquity by far. Based on recorded manuscripts that we have, the sheer volume of them, and as far as we can go back, which is, it, that's what we base all of our understanding of history on, is recorded manuscripts, we have more reason to believe the history and accounts of the New Testament than we do to believing that Julius Caesar ever even existed. Now, if you like to nerd out on stuff like this and are curious and this piqued your interest, we're going to record a podcast later this week, New Story Podcast, wherever you get your podcast. We're going to go in depth on this a little further. This is worthy of our trust. And the recorded accounts for me are compelling. But this is why, yeah, this is why I find it, it all compelling. But lastly, there's, there's one, more, one more reason, and it's, it's really the transformation of the eyewitnesses. A common idea is that we've, we've uh, Christians at that time, or the disciples got together, conspired together um, to, to, to just steal the body or lie to everyone or create this ruse. Um, I, I don't know what, what, what the idea is around that, but that's, that's the common idea. These people got together. It's all a ruse they put together. And if you've ever seen or read about a crucifixion, you would realize just how crazy it is to try and hold to something that, that tight. Just look, look, at, look at how they read about them, or how, how they write about them. That when they thought he was dead, they were hiding behind locked doors in a room. And when he was alive, they were running about sharing as loudly as they could. There was boldness, there was courage, there was strength that they didn't have before. And every single one of them went on to risk their life for the gospel. We have recorded that they were, they were jailed and martyred, every single one of them. Or even excommunicated. Some of them actually hung on a cross for this message. Because if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you don't have to fear death. The worst thing that could happen to you isn't the worst thing that could happen to you anymore. So I'll wrap up with this. If the resurrection is true, if what we celebrate is true, if what Jesus did, if, if Jesus did what he said, if the accounts are true and worthy of our trust, if the resurrection changed um, and transformed eyewitnesses then, it means that the resurrection can change everything for us today. The resurrection redefines what your future looks like. In fact, because of the resurrection, the future is full of hope and full of life in ways that hadn't been before. Death is not the end, and death doesn't have to fill us with fear anymore. What, you, what do you do with somebody that the worst thing that you could do to them is no longer the worst thing you could do to them? What do you do with someone like that? Them, they, they weren't afraid of death anymore. They went from a locked room to going out and telling the world about Jesus. And because they did that, they risked their life, they shed their blood. It's the reason that we sit here 2,000 years later, 7,000 miles later in Kansas City, Kansas, in, on, in 2023, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus because they went out, their lives were transformed. The resurrection redefined, completely changed their future and it can redefine yours. Not only that, it can redefine your past. We say here all the time, we've even said it today, that no matter who you are or where you've been, there's hope for a new story in Jesus. And when you look at the cross, I want you to see the promise of God to forgive you. What once was a symbol of death and fear has become a symbol of hope and forgiveness. Listen, I don't know what you've done, but Jesus does, and he did that for you. And the resurrection is proof that he redeems even the darkest of days. In fact, the resurrection means that your worst days don't define you any longer. You've got to think about their worst day. 
Good Friday wasn't Good Friday for about 48 hours. It was bad, horrific Friday. But Sunday came and redefined Friday. Sunday came and redefined the numbness of Saturday. It, it changed it. Saturday, it was a, a, the tomb was a grave, and on Sunday, it was a garden. On Sunday, the tomb was a place to weep, but on Sunday, it became a place to worship. On Saturday, it was a place of, of sadness. On Sunday, a place to rejoice. On Saturday, they mourned. On Sunday, they went to tell the world. It, we are, we are talking about this because of what happened on that Sunday. It changes the way we see ourselves completely. Because it means that the, res- the resurrection means that you were worth dying for. You were worth Jesus giving his life for. And please know, he went to that cross knowing. And so what you've done, where you've been, does not surprise him. And he doesn't regret dying for you. It's not like you do something, it's like, oh man, I really wish I hadn't climbed on that cross now. Or maybe you, you begin to think that what was accomplished there wasn't enough or, or that maybe people have made you think that, that Jesus had to hang on the cross a little longer to forgive your sins. And if somebody's made you feel like that, I'm sorry. You just need to know that there's, no, there is, there's nobody that Jesus loves more than you. In the same way, he gave his peace to the disciples in that upper room as he came in and showed them his scars. He wants to give you his peace and life in the room you're sitting in right now. Sunday redefined Friday, and if the resurrection can redeem death, there's nothing beyond redemption in your life. You don't have to fear death. You don't have to go through this life alone. You can know this peace that God offers. The, the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. We all know that some payment has to be done for wrongdoing. That's why we have a justice system. And we've done wrong before a holy God. And there's a debt we can never pay on our own. Jesus paid that debt so that we could be made right with God. He makes it possible because though it may be Saturday all around us and inside us, or Saturday all around us, it can be Sunday within us. The resurrection changes everything. Easter 2023 could be the Sunday when everything changes for you too. So let me go back to that original question. What's your best day? I'd say that if you ask me for a hundred years from now, I'd say the day I trusted Jesus would be the best day. And today can be your best day, a hundred years from now. You can look back on the day you trusted Jesus as the day you received hope, the day you received forgiveness, and the promise of eternal life. Those of us that are followers of Jesus in this room, this is truly your best day. For the rest of you, have you had that day? And see, that's the hope within me that keeps me pressing on. And when I say hope, I'm not talking about some like wishful thinking um, and, uh, and, and, and just, you know, this, this small thing like uh, that my team's going to win a, a championship. That's not something like that. This is foundational hope that my life is now built upon. This hope is placed in the one who's unchanging and he holds it in his nail-scarred hands. And this hope keeps me seeking his face in the darkness of Friday. He helps me hold on in the numbness and the silence of Saturday, knowing that one day, like John, I'm going to see his face. I'm going to see his eye color, his olive skin. I'm going to hear his voice. I'll see that I'm taller than him. But above that, I'll see his scars. And the scars remind me that what held him doesn't hold him anymore, and what holds me doesn't have to hold me anymore. Have you had that day? And could today be that day for you? In just a moment, we're going we're gonna to do something that's really special here on an Easter Sunday. We have some kids that have made that profession. They say, hey, my, I, I believe in the resurrection of Jesus. I put my faith and trust in him. They've had that day, and now they're going to go public with that through something we call baptism. 
But please, don't move on fully from this moment. If you need to talk with someone, please come talk with me. Talk with anyone who else is up here on the stage. Anyone that you came with. Could today be that day for you? Your best day ever. I'm going to pray for us, and then Dennis is going to come as we we move toward baptism. Father, thank you so much that the grave was not the end. Thank you that you went through, your son went through the agonizing pain for us, for my sin, a payment that I could not pay. Thank you, God. And God, these, these d- disciples, these followers of Jesus now sat in the darkness of Friday and the silence of Saturday, the numbness that they feel, their ears are ringing as they just relive the moment that their hope was in the grave. Some of us may feel in that space. And I simply ask for you to give us hope in that. Remind us that Sunday happened. Hope is alive. And that no matter who we are, where we've been, there's hope for a new story in your son, Jesus. We trust in him. We love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.